the Triathlon Show 178. Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to another episode of that Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and this episode is a follow-up on last week's interview with Steven Seiler on polarized training. It was episode 177. If you haven't listened to it yet, be sure to do so and I would recommend doing that before listening to this episode actually. So this is one of those uh, quite rare cases actually where the chronological order of how you listen to these episodes do matter. So go and check that out if you haven't already. Uh, But the idea here is to answer a lot of questions that came in both on the Scientific Triathlon Facebook page. I posted before the interview with Stephen that uh, I'm taking questions and uh, a lot of the topics were things that we did discuss during the interview, but there are also a lot of good questions that we didn't have time to cover. And the same thing I also posted on the Trainer Road forum where I try to be somewhat active at times when I have a little bit of spare time. And that is a really great forum. I ha- highly recommend that you check it out if you're, uh, if you're into discussing endurance sports. Uh, so there I got a even like a lot more questions actually than on Facebook. A really good discussion uh, came up there. So I have a lot of questions from the Trainer Road forum as well that we'll get into. And I'll answer these questions. Some of them are directed specifically to Stephen, of course. I know a lot about his sort of philosophy and teachings and I've listened to all the podcasts that he's appeared on. I listened to all of them again in preparation for my interview with him. So so I can answer both sort of from his perspective but also from from my perspective. Uh, which is uh, similar but in some cases uh, there are some nuances and, and differences between between those two perspectives. Before we get into that, however, big thanks to our sponsors Precision Hydration Precision Hydration make electrolyte products to help you get hydrated and stay hydrated. And uh, I just recently did a race, my first half distance race of the season. It went great. I took out fifth overall in the Setubal Triathlon, which is one of the biggest races in Portugal. Some seven or eight hundred participants, I believe. And uh, I actually in this race, I used Precision Hydration for my preloading strategy only. And I raced only with water because I chose to go with as light a bike as possible, because the bike course was very hilly, very tough. I only went with the integrated hydration that I have on my Venton bike, and I chose to go with water because I always want to have water with me on as hydration uh, in, in at least one bottle or one hydration tank. But this strategy also worked well, very, very well for me. I think it was very important that I had prehydrated and I never experienced any of the symptoms that getting dehydrated or getting low on sodium might cause you. It did get sweaty towards the end because the sun came out towards the end of the bike and the run and temperatures climbed up to above 20 degrees. So definitely not hot by any means, but uh, a bit hotter than it had been in the morning for sure when it was, it was quite cold. So, uh, so that worked well as well. But if you are not quite confident with how to experiment yourself and with what your will work for your body in your racing then precision hydration will provide you with uh, a free hydration strategy based on a quiz that is quite easy and simple to fill in it takes a, a few minutes of time and then a uh, 10 or 15 minutes to consume the uh, the results the and the strategy that you'll get so uh, you can go and do that whatever electrolyte products you use you can apply the strategy but of course i recommend precision hydration because they're great not only can you tailor the strengths to your individual sweat needs but they also actually taste better than any other electrolyte product that i've ever tasted so that's an additional bonus so again, check them out on precisionhydration.com and use the promo code that triathlon show, all one word, all caps, to get your first box for free. And big thanks to Roka. I also want to give a shout out to Roka for my race performance this weekend, which is fresh on my mind. Uh, I'm recording this two days after the race. Uh, so I used, a, used the Roka wetsuit, the Maverick X wetsuit, and the Roka R1 goggles with that additional angle uh, eye angle or sighting angle which uh, gives you it means that you have to basically uh, lift your head less to get good sighting and in poor visibility this was quite important for me Vis- uh, sighting was 
difficult enough in the damp and almost misty conditions that we had. Uh, so definitely I felt that those goggles, as tiny of a detail as it sounds like, with that additional angle for sighting, it did help. And finally, I used the Roka Gen 2 uh, sleeved tri suit for on the bike and, and the run. Uh, so, and that's always great, always very aerodynamic, which, uh, which I like and very comfortable both on the bike and on the run. Can be opened at the front, which I did use on the run, even though I did say that it's not, it wasn't super hot, but on the run, it's easy enough to overheat anyway. So I took every opportunity to, to pour water over me as well. Stay, staying cool, basically. So check out all the Roka products on roka.com and take 20% off your entire order with the code TTS all caps. So let's get into the topic, the polarized training follow-up episode and, and Q&A session. I will also give a couple of case examples or case studies, and those are from Stephen himself and from myself as well. So Stephen and I discussed before and after the interview a little bit, and we had some email uh, conversations. And as you heard in the interview last week, he rode uh, 285 watts in his 60 minute minute indoor hour of power test and he's 53 years old so that gives you some context also he's only been cycling since uh, since august i think he said in the email yes i have the notes here in front of me so since august he was at five hours of training per week from august through december and since January, he has uh, increased the volume slightly to seven hours per week, uh, ranging from five to nine, so averaging seven hours per week. Uh, he had one 10-hour week last month, so March 2019, but uh, he mentions that that is uh, difficult to, to achieve on any consistent basis with with work. So, uh, so seven hours per week is his recent average in the last three months, and before that, it was less so, so five hours per week. He mentions that he trains completely polarized, so that means that all his training is either low intensity or high intensity, nothing in between the two thresholds, LT1 and LT2. So yeah, this is the pure polarized version of training, no sweet spot included uh, or anything like that. That's the way that he trains. And uh, obviously it's been working well for him getting to 285 watts for 60 minutes. So that, again, that's not... 285 watt FTP as determined by a 95% of 20 minute power, because as we discussed last week, that's not a good way to estimate FTP really. Steven goes to full 60 minutes and he can hold 285 watts for that. He mentioned that he had a really good breakthrough session uh, just the day after the podcast. And uh, based on that, he's getting even closer to his goal of 300 watts for the full hour. He did do some competitive cycling for three years around 87 1987 to 90 so that's uh, some 29 years ago though and he switched to rowing rowing after that and and did that for a few years but uh, also mentions that the last few years have been too much work and not enough training so there you go on a pretty low volume of training uh, which is probably lower than many listeners here and and cycling only since august with any on any consistent basis uh, Steven has managed to get up to 285 watts for a full hour at 53 years of age. That's a great case study. And uh, I'll go into my personal case study and uh, actually talk about the training that I did leading up to this uh, half-distance race that I did the other day in Setubal, which was a great race for me, really, really great. Uh, and uh, I'll talk about that at the end of this episode. So we'll get into the questions first and then finish off with another case study. And this is on my training, which uh, also has great relevance to, to this topic. So uh, the questions here, the first ones are, I sort of tr tried to theme them around different themes. And uh, this first theme is around different, I guess, objections to polarized training or uh, at least, I, I guess, alternative views or viewpoints. Uh, so here's a question from the Trainer Road forum. It's from uh, Srike, user in Srike. Uh, and it's, is there really strong evidence out there that elites avoid certain zones? Uh, shouldn't we rename polarized training to HLIT, so high, low intensity training? And, and Srike mentions that it's probably not as catchy. Uh, so this is really great. Uh, it's, uh, 
probably my favorite question of all of them uh, because I, I think that that is really one of the key uh, key takeaways for me as well that uh, it's not so much that you have to be completely polarized even though Stephen trains this way and as he mentioned in last episode in the earlier research that they did in the early days they did find a very polarized approach in for example rowers uh, also to some extent cross-country skiers but later on as they start, started researching more disciplines like cycling and running uh, they found that uh, also a more pure middle approach where part of that high intensity was of a more mid-zone, medium intensity tempo or threshold or sweet spot type of training was present and potentially in a higher quantity than that very high intensity training. So it seems to definitely depend on the goal event and the, the discipline that we're talking about. Uh, and yeah, we can say that there's not like... As a whole, endurance athletes don't avoid certain zones. Uh, but uh, for example, rowers that compete for six minutes, Stephen mentions they do avoid that mid zone. And track cyclists would be another example, probably. Uh, Cross country skiers, Stephen mentioned, they do a lot of high intensity, but it's that kind of zone four in a five zone model. So just slightly above the second lactate threshold, but not going completely to VO2 max intensity. So it depends on what discipline you're looking at. In terms of triathlon, I would say that no, they do not avoid certain intensities. It, it is a more pyramidal approach, or at least including both that medium intensity and high intensity training. And the same for many cycling disciplines like road cycling and, and time trialing uh, would definitely be, be the case. So it isn't about avoiding certain zones. It's about knowing what you're training for and distributing your high and medium intensity accordingly but uh, but all these athletes in all dif dis different disciplines they do stick to that same amount of or, or they do stick to that same concept i should say of doing the vast majority of their training at a very uh, like at a low intensity uh, so that would be 80 percent or so of sessions 90 percent of or so of total training time so I think you're spot on, and I actually really like that name. Maybe it's not catchy, but I like it because it it talks about what I feel is the the most important takeaway from the message. It's high low intensity training. That's uh, that's really the main message that uh, that I want to give with with these episodes as well. It's not about avoiding certain zones, but it's about doing most of your training at a uh, at the appropriate low intensity. It doesn't mean that everything is a recovery ride or recovery run, but it means that you need to know what your zones are and what is low intensity for you. And uh, and depending on your discipline, for most of your athletes, a pyramidal approach might be actually better than a polarized. Uh, it depends on the individual as well. Uh, but pyramidal here does not mean 60% easy, 30% medium, and 10% hard. Uh, it can mean something like 85% easy, 10% medium and 5% hard. That is actually, here's a teaser for my uh, sneak peek coming up or my case study. That's the way that I train. 85% of my training in the last six weeks before uh, the race the other day was uh, low intensity, 10% or so was moderate intensity and 5% was high intensity. Next question is from Steve Palladino and he asks... Uh, on Steven's perspective on the Kenyan training distribution, at least for half and full marathons, apparently being at odds with the polarized training intensity distribution. And again, I think it's essentially the same answer as above. And I also did do a little bit of research. I read some of the things that you linked to, Steve, and, and some other research papers as well that, that uh, Dr. Seiler talked about. And I guess, yeah, that there are some different findings in some cases. The findings are that it is a polarized distribution, so not all uh, research on the Kenyan runners' training shows that it's not that it's pyramidal. Some of it shows that it's polarized, uh, and I think Dr. Seiler mentioned one of those studies in the interview last week, if I recall correctly. But some of the studies do show that it's more pyramidal, but again, they have that large chunk of time at low intensity. So, uh, for example, you sent a chart of Eliud Kipchoge's training leading up to. Uh, the, uh, to his world record 
it showed his times in zones or i guess uh, distances in zones so how many kilometers he did in different distances and when you uh, convert that so knowing that a zone one kilometer is going to take you much longer than a zone five kilometer it did seem that uh, at least 80 to 85 percent of his training time would be spent at, at low intensity training maybe 10 percent at moderate intensity and five percent at, at high intensity so probably a little bit less than 90 percent of time at low intensity but but more than 80 uh, percent it, w- it was a just a chart so difficult to say exactly because i didn't have the raw data but uh, yeah that uh, definitely goes along the lines of what i was saying before in the previous question that it's more so that all of these endurance athletes they adhere to that fact that most of the training a very large majority of the training is at low intensity and then how you distribute the remaining training time between moderate and high that depends a little bit on the athlete and the discipline and the goal event also remember that that 90 percent of time at a low intensity that is an average so there will be individual variations around that mark some will do 93 percent some will do 87 or 85 percent that maybe Elliot Kipchoge was around that that mark so to answer to summarize not at all at odds uh, considering that the main message is not so much about polarized I think that uh, there is a a bit of a semantics confuse, confusion here with polarized training. It's understandable because uh, Dr. Seiler coined that term when the earlier research suggested that all elite athletes really were avoiding the mid zone. But as he said himself, they don't do it. It depends on the discipline. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, that's, <laughs> I still, I keep coming back to that high, low intensity training. Uh, abbreviation that strike mentioned i i really like it and and i think that's the main message so so it's not at all at odds with that message which is also which is also the same message that dr seiler uh, wants to promote although he often does use the term polarized training uh, but that's not to say that absolutely everybody is training in a polarized way he mentioned that with with the different examples of of different disciplines and how how it differs between them Next question is uh, on. Uh, it's from the Trainer Road forum, forum again, I think, and it's how to reconcile a polarized, polarized model with race specificity. Uh, so uh, it's from uh, Janerne or Jane or Nay, I don't know. Uh, in general, he or she writes for a lot of people like myself or pros who will be doing a lot of high mountains. We spend an awful lot of uh, race time in zone three in the Cogan model or the five zone model. So surely training in this zone extensively and adapting to this effort level is useful since it will be the bulk of your effort during targeted events and yet it flies in the face of polarized training, I think. In my head, if you're going to spend a lot of time racing at this intensity, it is logical to spend a lot of time in that zone. So I would like input to the required volume of this work as in, is it useful to have prolonged blocks of this kind of race specific work like sweet spot training or does siler just mean doing a session every week or two that works on this treating it as a high intensity session in the plan uh, i don't believe any specific volumes of this kind of work was discussed it could be wrong though okay so uh, i mean actually volume is discussed it comes back to that either 20 percent of sessions as not low intensity sessions or 10 percent of time as not low intensity sessions uh, Dr. Seiler did give some specifications for triathletes that maybe you can you can adjust that a little bit. Like for example, for somebody training nine times per week, three times per week in each discipline, doing one hard swim, one hard bike, and one hard run might might be might make sense to do. So that's not twenty percent of sessions. It's a bit more than that, but uh, but it gives you an idea of the volume. And uh, again, you have to choose basically how you distribute that non-low intensity time, whether it's mid zones or like sweet spot or whether it's high zone. So like above threshold, so super threshold or VO2 max type of work. And uh, so that's fairly easy. It it all comes down to how much you're, you're training really. And in terms of race specificity that you mentioned and, and whether to choose to do more or less at that uh, mid zone which is race specific for triathletes and for many cyclists my perspective personally here is that i think race specificity is often very overrated 
when compared to building the engine, building, working the, f- the physiology. Uh, I do think that building the engine is the best way by far to, and the most important thing by far for endurance athletes. Now, in some cases, for some events, uh, building the engine and race specificity is essentially, they fall very neatly on top. They align very neatly. So a 10K runner or an Olympic distance triathlete, for them, that race specific intensity, I would say is also absolutely fantastic for building the engine. But on the other hand, for an Ironman athlete, it is not. So, so I would do much more race specific training for an Olympic distance athlete than for an Ironman athlete. I would do slightly more race specific training for a 70.3 athlete compared to the Ironman athlete, uh, because it's more useful than the Ironman race specific intensity, but I would do less than for an Olympic distance athlete. Uh, however, for any race event, whether it's triathlon or cycling, I do agree that some race specific training is useful. Uh, like for example, for in training for a long distance, uh, se- like a 7.3 or an Ironman, I would usually prescribe race specific training in the last four to eight weeks before a key event. And the more experienced the athlete is, I think that the less race specificity is needed actually. So a more beginner athlete, like a first time Ironman athlete, they would probably do six to eight weeks of race specific training. And with that, I want to say not all their workouts are race specific uh, most of them are still low intensity workouts and actually ironman intensity for a beginner is usually uh, even borderline low intensity but uh, the point being that they would do within that six to eight week block they would regularly do race specific race specific workouts somebody who is a kona contender who is an experienced athlete they might do just four to six weeks of that race specific intensity for a b race like personally at this race that I did, I, I did take a week to recover for it or taper for it or six days, I guess. Uh, but uh, it's still just preparation for a more important 7.3 that I have coming up in five weeks time. So, so it was a B race for me, not a C race, but not an A race either. And I did, I did a bit of race specific intensity on the run and a bit on the swim. I did no race specific intensity on the bike. Absolutely none, zero. And I had a really great bike, one of the fastest of the day. So, so I think that you can do really great without, without race specific intensity. What I did do a lot of was training right at my threshold. And this is actually something that I'm, uh, s- uh sort of struggling with. Like when I'm tra- training right at my threshold, do I classify that as high intensity or moderate intensity? I think, uh, by the letter of the law, right at threshold would still be moderate intensity and not high intensity but it's right there on that edge so so that's uh, and i also did uh via to max type of sessions so uh two to four minute intervals in that build uh, but uh, no race specific intensity so uh and, and i did a great bike uh, one of my best best races that i've done ever so so i think that you don't have to do you don't have to overemphasize race specificity and as long as you're building that engine arrive at the starting line very very fit then you're going to do well and yeah remember that the more experienced you are the the more you can focus on building the engine or or the 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 more you can the less you need to emphasize race specificity i would say because pacing is generally not going to be an issue you have built economization at race intensity in previous builds you don't necessarily need to do as much of it right now so so that's i guess those are the main the main things that I would consider. As for your question of if it flies in the face of polarized training, no, uh, again, it comes down to that terminology. The key message being do enough low intensity training. Uh, So you need to not overdo race intensity because then you will do a lot of moderate intensity. So I hope that that answers this question. Next question is from uh, B. Barbera again on Trainer Road's forum, who asks, which cycling coaches have adopted polarized training? Do those coaches only use polarized training or do they only apply it to certain phases of the training year? Do those coaches use sweet spot and or tempo training with their athletes? And if yes, during what phase of the training year? Uh, so uh, a lot of this was already discussed. And uh, yes, uh, they do use sweet spot tempo training as well. Uh, and uh, road cycling and triathlon seem to be among the sports that do use that more pyramidal approach still doing a lot of that low intensity 
Uh, so pyramidal here does not mean 60, 30, 10, but rather uh, 85, 10, 15. Again, coming back to that previous example. And uh, in terms of periodization, there may be slight changes across a year in terms of that distribution of intensity zones. Uh, but those changes are mostly about the distribution of moderate and high intensity. It, I would say this is my personal perspective on, on the question and, and not something that I know what Stephen would answer. But uh, yeah, this is definitely my, my own personal perspective. I want to make that clear. Uh, so, so yeah, they, they might change distribution of moderate to high intensity depending on the block they're in. And also the other thing being that the easy training becomes even easier closer to race day. Uh, and a great study that you can have a look at is called The Road to Gold. Uh, I linked to it in the previous episode and I can link to it again. It has data from a lot of world champion, Olympic champion, cross-country skiers, uh, mostly, I think only cross-country skiers actually, and their periodization or actually more so nuanced differences in training intensity distribution leading up to a gold medal. And it really is what it is. It's very nuanced. It's not as if a lot is changing, uh, but you can still make changes within those perimeters of, of that training intensity distribution. So it doesn't feel like you're doing the same thing over and over again. As for which cycling coaches are, are using it, uh, I'm not following that space, the professional cycling scene very much, to be honest. Uh, but bear in mind here that the research that this is all based on, it comes from elite endurance athletes that have elite endurance coaches. So obviously elite endurance coaches are using this approach. This is where it all comes from. It, it's, it comes from the coaches. And some examples from this very podcast where we have gone into great detail on the training of elite triathletes specifically uh, definitely shows that coaches like Joel Filial and Adil Tweiten are using this high, low intensity training approach in a pyramidal way as discussed with their triathletes even though they haven't used the terminology the same way but it's clear from just listening to those interviews that it's what they're doing so uh, yeah I, I think that elite endurance cyclists are using it just like elite uh, or elite endurance cycling coaches are doing it because otherwise how could the elite cyclists be doing it unless the training was prescribed to them by their cycling coaches unless they're purposefully uh, just not doing the training that their coaches pres prescribe, but I don't think that they would be elite if that is what they would be doing. So, uh, so yeah, I think that that answers this question. The next one is from Sumbo on Trainer Road's forum again. Uh, what evidence is there that a polarized approach is more effective than sweet spot at low volumes, let's say four to seven hours per week? I don't doubt that you can improve following either approach. The question is which is most effective uh, in this specific cage. Uh, so uh, yeah, that is the question. And my answer is that there is some evidence, like a few studies. Uh, however, I would agree that for the amateur athletes, we need more and better scientific evidence comparing uh, different approaches directly. And I talked about this on a past Q&A episode, and I think there are some flaws in, in some of the, these studies on amateur athletes, for sure. So most of the evidence, I would say, is anecdotal. And uh, and I, I think that it's there. Uh, and I'm not talking about strictly adhering to you have to do 90% of your training time easy when you're training five or six hours per week, let's say, but still following those same principles. Maybe it's 80%, maybe even some weeks it's 75%. That's okay because maybe the next week is a recovery week where you do do 90%. I do think that those boundaries, they, in my just coaching intuition and experience, they change a little bit. For me, that's how I coach. Maybe, may, maybe athletes would do even better if I was following it more strictly, which I don't. It's just ends up being what it ends up being, but it does follow this, this principle. As for whether sweet spot is more effective than polarized. Well, if we're talking purely polarized in terms of what to do with your non low intensity training, yeah, I think this is uh, quite individual. And again, it comes back to what event that you're training for and where you are in your training cycle. Uh, for those amateur athletes i as i said I, I don't know that the evidence is really there for this group in terms of comparing directly sweet spot versus versus polarized if you make sure that that sweet spot training group also does that large amount of 
low intensity training in that case yeah th those studies just haven't been done so i can't say for sure i think maybe dr seiler would say that polarized is better than doing that whatever amount of higher intensity that you have at a more moderate intensity i, I think that there is uh, definitely a case for looking at what the individual responds to here so so yeah i, I i'm staying quite neutral in terms of this question and i would say that experiment with both see what works for you uh, an interesting related episode here that we'll get into a bit later is uh, uh, the interview that i did with sebastian weber who talked about how vla max in addition to vo2 max is uh, an important variable for uh, for endurance performance and improving your your threshold power especially so if you are somebody who have a naturally high vla max then perhaps sweet spot training might be better than than that more high intensity training so individual differences but uh, individual differences that's an easy answer to fall back on so if i were to plan let's say a five hour training week for for a cyclist uh, and like try to make it as a good general template for a training week what i would do for that cyclist would be to do a, a one two hour ride low intensity ride one 1.5 hour ride and uh, that would also be low intensity. And then one 50 minute ride, which would include threshold intensity or, or slightly above threshold intensity. So for example, those famous four times eight minute intervals that Steven Seiler has researched a lot with, uh, I think it's just two minute recoveries. So you can do that in 40 minutes or for, yeah, 40 minutes for the main set and, uh, 10 minutes of warm up and you're done in 50 minutes. And then the last session would be 40 minutes. That takes you to five hours exactly. And that would also be an intense session, a VO2 max session with perhaps getting in 20 minutes around VO2 max intensity or 18 minutes or so. And that would give you 50% uh, or 50 minutes of intensity during that week, during that five hour training week. Let's say 30 minutes or 32 minutes of threshold and 18 minutes of sweet spot uh, or VO2 max, sorry. That gives you 17% at moderate or high intensity so not that far off from the 90 percent uh so th that's basically how i would structure and without even thinking about what whether it's polarized or not that would be like if you wake me up in the middle of the night and ask me to plan a five-hour training week for a cyclist i might say something like that i might not immediately think of that you need to do 50 minutes and 40 minutes to get to <laughs> to five hours but i think that that one two hour ride and that one one and a half hour low intensity ride getting both of those in that is great for building that longer aerobic endurance but it's not too long so you can still fit it in very well so yeah that's uh that, that would be an example of how to how to do this and it would still give you two intense sessions which is definitely enough you, you do not need to do more than two intense sessions per week absolutely not no matter how much time you have to train uh, for a single sport triathlon is a bit different but even if you're training eight times per week on the bike or 10 let's make it 10 because that's where the <laughs> original 80 20 comes from then that two times per week is still going to be right there in the sweet spot of how much intensity you should be doing so i got a bit sidetracked there uh, it's not exactly answering your question i guess that the answer is that i don't think personally that there is a definitive answer yet but I do think that you need to have that adherence to doing a lot of low intensity training, even if you're training at a lower volume, for sure. Because otherwise, you, you'll you probably run into stagnation at least. Probably not over training, but just stagnation. And uh, and that's uh, yeah, that, that's the main issue with with not doing enough of that low intensity low intensity training. I'm definitely going to be looking into this, like in my own coaching, what seems to be working better in terms of sweet spot versus more polarized. And uh, maybe I'll have an update a bit later on if I find anything that's uh, of interest. Next, we have uh, Augie on the Trainer Road Forum who writes, I see massive benefit in all the zone one, all the low intensity training. So Siler is zone one in the three zone model. Uh, after reading, listening about polarized training at the start of last season, I started training with a heart rate monitor for the first time. And it's been a real eye-opener about intensity control. I train more consistently and have been generally healthier since I got my easy workouts under control. I definitely think polarized training has been overhyped, though. 
I don't think it scales down to age groupers training 6 to 10 hours a week. I've also listened to plenty of podcast interviews with some of the top triathlon coaches and I genuinely haven't heard about any of the top athletes training like this. The approach that Joel Filial spoke about in his interview with Michael resonates with me more. All right, so yeah, as mentioned, this is uh, basically going back to the same things that uh, we've been discussing here from the start. That yes, if you talk about strictly polarized, then... I would agree with you, but I don't think that that's the message that we should take home. The message is about that low intensity training more so. And especially for those, these sports like triathlon and, and road cycling, uh, it's, uh, it's a more pyramidal approach with a large amount of low intensity, but all, but including that moderate in- intensity as part of your quality sessions that you do do. So, uh, so if you forget about that, I guess, naming convention, then Joel Filial would 100% fall in this same category of uh, how to train effectively according to the, the research and the, yeah, the things that, that Dr. Seiler talked about in, in last week's episode. So uh, that's, that's my opinion. And you can go back and re-listen to it, and I think that you'll find the same. As for overhyped, yeah, I think it comes down to that naming convention. And, and I do agree that the idea of avoiding certain intensities uh, I, I'm looking at this from a triathlon perspective. I'm not knowledgeable about rowing or track cycling or middle distance running or speed skating or any of these short events and how to train optimally for them. So I can't talk from that perspective, but from a triathlon perspective, the idea of avoiding certain intensities, which uh, is uh, what in the media has become a bit popularized, even though Seiler doesn't really promote that himself and his research doesn't support that either that is yeah it is uh it is hype i guess you could call it and uh, to me i think that that in triathlon in in road cycling in road running from from the 5k and up the 5k is an a very aerobic endurance event uh i think that the idea of avoiding certain intensities it it doesn't really sit well with how, how i think that is the most effective to train but doing that large amount of low intensity training it does and it makes sense and and it's a naming convention that has caused any any hype that we may have which i can see how how you're looking at it that way but but if you look past that naming convention then then i don't think that it's hype i, I think it's just basic and it's not new like look at what arthur lydia did and if you remember joel filial's interview his recommended resources were the old books by Arthur Lydiard, and he's uh, perhaps the godfather of this way of training, not polarized per se, but doing that large amount of low intensity training, having even his 800 meter, 1500 meter runners do 150, 160, maybe 180 kilometer running weeks, something crazy like that, if I recall correctly. So, so it's not new. It's, it's not hype, but the naming convention may be a bit unfortunate since it doesn't really have to be polarized. It depends on the context, but it does have to have that large low intensity base. As for again, the age group question, whether it scales down to six to 10 hours of training per week. I mean, I think first of all, you don't, shouldn't get too hung up on any magical percentage, like 90% or 80%. It can shift around those a little bit. It shouldn't shift around those too much though, uh, like doing too much more intensity. But, uh, but I think that if you train less, like if you have a very low volume, then sure, you could do a little bit more in- intensity proportionally and, and it could work. So, so I don't think that you have to get too hung up on that, but, but definitely keep an eye on it for sure. And and I think it scales down much better than anything scales up actually. So that's that's an important thing to consider that research done in elite athletes if you find an intervention that works or you find find uh retrospectively that something has worked in elite athletes then it is very likely that the same thing also works for athletes that are less elite than those athletes. The other way around that's not at all the case. So if you take a group of college students that are untrained and you do something some i don't know some internal training scheme with them and and then you see that they get an improvement that doesn't mean by any means that you're going to see that same improvement in the elites because they're so different and it's going to take so much more to make them fitter than it takes to make those college students fitter like almost just getting off the couch is going to make them fitter so so that's the reason that things uh, these findings they scale down from elite to age groupers to amateurs 
but they don't scale up in the same way. So, so I think that that's something that is also the difference between elites and amateurs is could can be over exaggerated at times, and I don't think that that's necessarily a a good perspective either. I, I think that there are many more similarities between how elites and amateurs should be training than there are differences for sure. So, so if you find yourself training with, uh, I don't know, 60% of your training time at low intensity, which is way off that 90% that is the, I guess, recommended target, then that is going to be too big of a difference for sure to be effective, especially long term. When I've been calculating my own training intensity distributions, I see in certain periods in the past, not, not this side of the year, but in the past uh, that I've seen as low as 70% of my training at low intensity. And uh, actually, in some cases, I've had pretty good results short term, like good improvements short term. And uh, But in some cases, it's been too much long term. I've had some overtraining issues or overreaching issues, as I've talked about before. And uh, in some cases in the past, I also think that even though I didn't have those same issues, I probably still did, although I haven't calculated it. I still did that same sort of distribution, like 70% to 80% at low intensity. And I think in hindsight that I probably did too much and I could have gotten more improvements if I, during those periods, had been doing more low intensity training and less high intensity training. So uh, that is, again, just a personal example. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about hard and easy workouts. Uh, first, hard workouts. This question is from Strike again. How intense should intense days be? Uh, so some people brag around about how hard the hard days really are. And this is uh, not consistent with what Seiler has said in some podcasts. And according to the philosophy that a block of training like months and years is more important than a single interval session. So my answer to this question is that Yes, exactly. It's uh, not consistent that you have to like really kill yourself. That's what Dr. Seiler said in, in this interview as well. If you go back and listen to it, so he, they have found that being around at 90% of maximum heart rate is really beneficial and collecting minutes, accumulating mil- minutes at that intensity. Again, coming back to that example, which is just an example. It's not a magical formula, but it's something that they have researched. The four times eight minute workout it tends to end up around that 90% max heart rate on average. And in those studies that they have done, they have also, they have also uh, measured the RPE, the rating of perceived exertion of the athletes. And it's not all out. It's not as hard as some even harder sessions, like four times four minutes at a higher intensity. So it is very hard, don't get me wrong. But I think this is another common misconception of polarized training along with that you should avoid certain zones, this misconception is that you have to go absolutely all out, balls to the walls in your hard workouts. And that's just not the case. And uh, going moving on to my own interpretation and opinion and perspective is that you should go hard and sometimes very, very hard, but never puke hard, like really, almost never, I, I should say, puke hard, like really raising the workout you should always, almost always feel like there's a little left in the tank. And uh, personally, I've been using this not more so this year in 2019 than previously. And it's worked great for me. I'm putting less pressure on myself to always do better in a workout than I've done before. And I'm fitter than ever. I recover faster. And this is one of the most important changes that I've made since uh, since getting becoming self-coached again, that, uh, that now I'm, I'm not racing as much. Uh, not myself, but also I'm training alone more. I'm not training very much with a group. And with a group, what often ended up happening, especially in swim workouts and and uh, track workouts on the run, they all ended up being puke hard. Like I could do nothing more at the end of those workouts. And I don't think that that was beneficial at all. So, uh, so yeah, I think that they should be hard and even very hard, but not puke, puke hard, not all out. So, and finally, your point there with that the bigger blocks of training being more important than single sessions, 100%. That is so true. And that is another very important takeaway. Look at the big picture. Next question on hard workouts is from Arnaud Deli, I think. 
And he asks, what for Dr. Seiler are the best free training sessions for swimming, biking, and running? Well, there are no magical sessions, but uh, the concept that he prescribes a lot is to accumulate minutes at a high intensity, but at an intensity that allows you to get in 30 to 40 minutes at a consistent high output. So this usually ends up being that 90% of heart rate max as an average. If you compare this to your threshold power, your threshold pace, it would be probably around threshold or a little bit faster than threshold, but not at VO2 max. So again, that four times eight minute wor- workout is a perfect example. In Siler's research, they had two minute recoveries. I actually do a lot of four times eights myself. I tend to take four minute recoveries and I think that that works fine, even better for me. I don't think that two minutes would be better at all for me. I like the four times eight with four minute recoveries. That's, that's my, my preference. In terms of pace, uh, doing these kinds of workouts at your 10k race pace, if you're like a sub 45 minute 10k runner, especially. And if you're a slower runner than that, then maybe you're between your five, between your five and 10k race pace or something, something like that would be like a good intensity to try to accumulate that 30 to 40 minutes of, of intensity at. Next question is from a Webby Rex on the trainer road forum i think who asks how to combine weight training with the high intensity training recommended does weight training count in the high intensity quota and uh, to answer that question first well i have no idea actually what steven would say on this so this is completely my personal perspective but for me it's neither high nor low intensity training it is training i count it in the, the amount of hours that i train per week but i don't I don't categorize it in, it doesn't affect the, the amount of low intensity or high intensity training that I'm doing. And actually, when I calculate my training intensity distributions, so I should clarify, I do calculate it in my training hours. So if I say that I have done a 22 hour training week, that would usually include a little bit of strength training. But when I say that I've done 85% of my training at a low intensity, that is 85% of my swim, bike, and run training only. So I calculate my percentages based on my endurance activities and not my strength training. So so that's what I do. Uh, in terms of structuring it in your weekly plan, I do try to keep strength training away from my easiest days because I want to make sure that those easiest days remain truly easy. Uh, the other question from WebRex is... Uh, what is Dr. Seiler's opinion on the efficacy of micro intervals? For example, 30 seconds on, 15 seconds off, times 10, instead of, for example, solid blocks of eight minutes. Well, based on some of the things that we discussed in last week's interview and that I just mentioned with the, for example, four times eight minutes intervals, accumulating minutes, I think I can safely say without having asked directly that, uh, that Stephen prefers those solid blocks of training. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he's against micro intervals. I don't know what, what his opinion is on those at all. I think personally that micro intervals can be highly useful, but it depends on the context and the objective. For more information on that, I recommend that you listen to my interviews with Professor Paul Larson on the science and application of high intensity interval training. We have uh, one, two, three parts, and uh, you can, I don't remember the episode numbers, but you can probably Google Paul Larson Scientific Triathlon, and you should find all of them. Uh, So if I remember, I'll put them in the show notes as well. Um, He has great information on how microintervals can be very beneficial in both those interviews, but also in the Science and Application of Interval Training book and the course, both of which I'm consuming at the moment, actually. So... They are useful. I would say personally, I don't think they are as useful as, for example, six times three minutes or four times four minutes or five times four minutes. I prefer those longer, longer VO2 max sessions compared to micro VO2 max sessions. And especially if the comparison is the eight minute blocks, those are more like super threshold training. So it's a di- almost a different system, sort of, well, not, not a different system. I take that back. But uh, but it's a different intensity level for sure. So actually, it would be completely doable and uh, probably a good way to structure your plan. If you're, for example, a single sport athlete or a cyclist, you do your 80%, 90% of easy training, uh, but you have room for two intense sessions. So do one 
intense session of those four times eight minute sessions, as I mentioned in the previous example. And then the other intense session, you would do a VO2 max session. Well, then you can choose between, for example, six times three minutes or doing micro intervals. And in the science and application of high intensity interval training book and course, one of the things to consider there is that the strain from those micro intervals is slightly less than from those six times three minutes or four times four minutes, even though the effectiveness might be slightly less as well. But if you're in a heavy block of training, you still want to get a bit of a VO2 max dose, maybe consider doing micro intervals rather than doing those really those longer VO2 max intervals. If you're not in a heavy block of training, you can handle doing six times three minutes, then I would prefer to do that because you're probably going to get a slightly better dose, a slightly better stimulus, even though the it's going to take you a bit more to recover as well. But that's going to be worth it since you're not in a super high volume block or or just generally demanding block of training. So that's that's the way that I would recommend you do it. And uh, then another question, I don't remember who asked this uh, or I don't have it noted, but that is how much intensity uh, mid and high zone combined is too much, both in terms of training stress and cumul cumulative duration. Uh, so again, it comes back to that 80 to 20 sessions. So 80% of sessions should be low intensity uh, or 90% of time should be easy, low intensity. Uh, that's uh, the research that's uh, Dr. Seiler's teachings personally I prefer to use that time based uh, distribution calculation for lower volume athletes but also for triathletes for various reasons so for myself even though I'm a higher volume athlete I also use the time based distribution rather than the session based so then it's simply a matter of calibrating how much training are you doing what is 10% of that that is your quota for higher intensity training so moderate plus high. But again, I would give some leeway to low intensity, low, sorry, low volume athletes. I don't think that it's as strict as that. I think that 80% of low intensity work is, is fine. Uh, you're definitely going to, m most low intensity athletes are going to be able to, to handle that really well in, in my experience, at least. Maybe it would be even better with 90%. Again, I, I should do some systematic testing with this for sure. I haven't, so I can't say for sure. But I do think that that you can you have some flexibility in there. It's not rigid. There's no magic formula. These are, after all, averages based on averages in, in research studies. To answer your question on acute and as well as long-term limits for intensity, I think that in the short crash blocks, you can definitely get away with doing more higher intensity like doing 70% low intensity or or something like that and and then you take a an easy block of training to to recover and and adapt to that that stimulus so uh, so that would be like an an intensity camp in in that way so so that i i think works acutely but you definitely don't want to do that for too long and it's always better to err on the side of caution than going overboard and getting overtrained because you lose so much more if you cross cross over to the to the wrong side of the tracks so to say so so do be careful with those crash blocks if you do them but I, and i think that the longer the perspective you look at like looking over months of training and uh, and years then it like the longer the perspective the more it becomes important to have enough low intensity training so when you look back at your month you should already see that it's converging towards that nice high low intensity training approach and and especially so when you look at the block of several months or an entire season all right so another theme of questions that we have here is around easy workouts and uh, this first one is which would be preferable one four hour ride on the weekend or two times three hour rides back to back on the weekend and why is this so this i can only answer for myself not for dr seiler but my opinion is absolutely two times three minutes uh, three hours <laughs> no questions about it uh, three hours is already a good duration so getting in an extra hour and hours and do four hours that is great of course but the upside of doing two three hour workouts getting in 50% more total volume, six hours rather than four hours. 
that makes it a simple question to me to choose the two times three hour option. This is, uh, I'm assuming from a cycling perspective, not triathlon because for triathletes, you would of course have to consider the swim and the run as well. But, but from a pure cycling perspective, definitely go with that two times three hours. The next question is from Anthony Lane, who writes, is the aerobic work that makes up the low volume, low intensity training always the same? For example, is it always to do a two to four hour ride at your low intensity heart rate? Or does that vary from week to week? Again, this is my perspective. Uh, my impression from what Siler himself does in his training is that he actually does quite long, all of his low intensity rides as quite long rides. So I don't, I think he mentioned one and a half hours or something like that in last week's episode. I can't quite remember, but I think he did. And I may be wrong here, but, but that was the impression that I got. So take this with a, with a grain of salt. Uh, in any case, my personal perspective is that I do mix the low intensity work into three different categories of workouts. So we have recovery workouts and then we have easy endurance. So in a five zone system, those would be, I would typically write something like zone one slash zone two. It's more, it's sort of like the athlete's choice. And then the final category would be LT1 or extensive endurance. And that would be be training that is done more at the upper end of that low intensity so around that first lactate threshold or the aerobic threshold and that that wouldn't necessarily be the entire session but for example in uh in a marathon training block we might do a workout like like a, a two and a half hour run with one and a half hours at lt1 heart rate so right at that upper end of the low intensity zone and then that would maybe be sandwiched between two 30 minute blocks that would be lower intensity so so very easy very very easy intensity and the duration of these workouts would differ so you can have something as short as a 20 minute run or maybe a 30 minute ride for the recovery segment and you could have something as long as a four hour four or five hour ride uh, for the easy endurance or lt1 type of workouts they serve different purposes to some extent but all of them serve ultimately also to the purpose of building that strong aerobic base through just frequency of training and consistent training volume, building biological durability and fatigue resistance. So so this is my perspective. I don't think that you have to do only one and a half hour rides or even one hour rides or two hour rides. I think that a 45 minute ride, easy ride has its place. In fact, the majority of my rides in the build up to my race the other day was probably a very much, a very boring, very easy one hour easy ride that I typically did around, I think 150 watts. And I did them at something like 100 beats per minute, especially in the later parts of, of that training build when I got really fit. And that is in contrast to when I would do something like four times eight minutes or four times nine minutes I did and, and various workouts like that at or slightly above or slightly below my second threshold. In those workouts, I would be around maybe 150 beats per minute. So, so a lot significantly lower heart rate as well then. And those would be done around two, depending on if I was indoors, 200. 80 to 290 watts and outdoors 300 to 310 watts or something like that so it's a massive range there both in heart rate and and power between between those hard and and those easy workouts but those easy workouts they add up they they add up so that's uh the take-home message there Okay, we're approaching an hour here and I'm going to take one question from one more category. And this is specifically questions, although we have touched upon this quite a lot already, but this is the category that I named time crunched, time crunched age groupers. And there are a lot of questions in this category. I'm going to pick one for now. And this one is from Xaba Zapanos, who writes, does a polarized approach differ for age groupers having 7 to 12 hours per week to train? Do they need more intensity, more easy, or the same percentages? So I've, from Steven Seiler's perspective, uh, the answer would probably be it's the same. 
and he's a great example of that himself and he's done a lot of work with amateur athletes in their lab they see a lot of people they do a lot of research so so and i would definitely consider him an authority on the subject so so i would trust his opinion my personal perspective and experience which again is not necessarily the right one is that it would be almost the same but i would have some flexibility there so uh, so i would give a little bit more leeway for a higher percentage at high intensity for for lower volume athletes and the lower the volume the more leeway i would give so for 12 hours i would give very little leeway at all but for seven hours i would definitely consider doing 80 percent low intensity instead of 90 percent that might be that would in, in the way that i've been coaching it would be totally fine but uh, yeah i would as i said i would be very curious to see what happens if i systematically try to change this and see what happens when if if we really stick to 90 percent it would be quite interesting so so maybe i'll do that and again maybe i'll report back on those results again personally i'm around that 85 percent, but i do train a lot i train uh, 20 hours or so per week uh, the swim skews the results a little bit because both the bike the bike is probably right around 90 percent low intensity the run is maybe 87 percent low intensity and the swim is where it's like 79 or 80 percent low intensity so perhaps i should do more low intensity swimming or less high intensity who knows the swim is incidentally the discipline that went the worst for me in my race so I guess this wraps up for the questions for today because there are so many that I could be here for another hour and I have a lot of coaching to do. So I actually need to start to wrap up this episode. I promised to give that report of my own race and I will do that in my training, I should say, leading up to to the race. Uh, So what I'll do is I'll do another follow-up episode and uh, cover the rest of the questions, the ones that we did not have time for today. So there are many more of them. And if you have questions in the meantime, do send them in on michael at scientifictriathlon.com and it's michael with a K. And I'll add them as well to the list for a future a future follow-up polarized training Q&A episode. But my personal example for the Setubal Triathlon half-distance race, uh, the season opener, the long-distance season opener in, in Portugal. So uh, a very well-participated race, uh, a very good, strong race. Uh, the training that I did for that, I'm just going to go through, run through the stats here. I'm just going to open a second. So give me a minute here. So I have here, I was sick in late February for 10, 12 days. So the first week I'm including here is the first full week that was back to normal training. And that was the week starting the 4th of March. And then the last week that I'm including is the week starting the 2nd of no, sorry, this is wrong. They're starting the 8th of April. And that was the race week. So I include in that week, in the other weeks, the preceding weeks, I include races as well in the calculations. But in race week, I only include Monday through Saturday. So only the training, not the race itself. So ba- basically we have a one, two, three, four, five, six week block of training here, minus one day, minus race day. So it's 41 days of training for me that that we're looking at and i've been calculating the times in zones for this block i haven't been calculating the sessions but a typical week for me would be 45 swims and uh, two of them would be intense swims one would typically be a vo2 max type of swim so for example 12 times 100 8 times 150 on 2 to 1 work to rest ratio and uh, the other would be more like a threshold session, either a shorter or longer. It might be 10 times 200. It might be 5 times 400 or something like that. Usually around 1,800 to 2,000 meters total work, which ends up being around about 30 minutes of total work at threshold. And typically with fairly short recoveries. So for an, a 10 times 200, I might do 20 second recoveries, maybe have a bit extra recovery at halfway point in the set but fairly short recoveries on the bike i did uh, usually one long ride so four to five hours and i did one via two max session and most of the time those were two to three minute intervals i did do some four minute intervals early in the block i think and also earlier in the year but I think in this last six-week block, I didn't do much of those four-minute intervals. I might have done one session, but mostly two to three minutes was the, the range that I did those via two max intervals in. 
and I did a session with uh, which typically targeted right around threshold. That that was really what I was aiming for in that second session. So I have categorized categorized that as a moderate intensity session. It is really on that edge between the moderate and high intensity. Like it would be a four times eight or four times nine or something like that. 30 to 45 minutes of intensity typically in that session. And uh, the other one would have 15 to 22 minutes of intensity, the VO2 max session. And that was it for the bike. The rest was all low intensity. So five to six rides per week. A lot of those one hour, one hour very easy rides and maybe an additional one and a half hour easy ride. And uh, then finally for the run, I did for the beginning of the block, I did only one, again, those times of slightly above threshold in this case on the run. Four times eight minutes was a bread and butter. I did some three times 10 minutes and that was probably right around threshold. I did three times 11, those types of like trying to get again, 30 to 40 minutes of work. I did a long run that was uh, 145 to two hours long. I did, I ran five, six, six times per week almost all weeks i want to say and uh, i did do brick runs but i never did intense brick runs i i only did brick runs to say some time so it was all easy collecting minutes at a low intensity uh, in weeks uh, three and two out from the race so not the race week but the two weeks before that i added a second intense run to my week so in addition to that typical threshold run i would add a tempo run so that would be 30 minutes continuous running at slightly above it would be basically my my open half marathon race pace uh, i want to say so so that would be the typical weekly structure now if we look at my intensity distributions for just looking at the numbers here so for the swim across those six weeks I had 79% at low intensity, 14% at moderate intensity, including those threshold workouts, and 7% of high intensity, including including high intensity. For the swim here, by the way, I have converted the distance into time. And I estimate that low intensity is 10% slower than uh, moderate intensity is, uh, sorry, moderate temp- intensity is 10% faster than low intensity, and high intensity is 15% faster than low intensity. So that way I can calculate based on distance, what my actual time distribution is. Uh, For the bike, I did 87% of my work at low intensity, 10% at moderate intensity, and only 3% at a high intensity. And for so very pyramidal there. And uh, for the run, I did 83% at a low intensity, 11% at moderate, and 6% at a high intensity. Uh, Because I did do some of those, yeah, uh, uh, because those threshold workouts on the run were actually slightly above threshold, whereas the on the bike I did target right at threshold. Even though it's not specific as that, it's not as if some switch magically turns on. I just know intuitively that I was working relatively slightly harder in those run workouts. The intensity was slightly high, higher compared to the bike workouts. So that's why I made the distinction there that the bike... The, was really moderate intensity and the, the run four times eight minutes was high intensity. I also know based on my paces that I did in those run intervals that I couldn't hold that for one hour, but I know that for the, for the bike moderate, for the bike FTP work that I did, I could hold it probably for, for around one hour if I, if I did a very steady effort. So in total, when you sum up all of my work, I did 84% at a low intensity, 11% at a moderate intensity, and 5% at high intensity. So again, high low intensity training, but with a pyramidal approach that works well for triathlon. And in the weeks, as in differences between weeks, I have some weeks that are 88% at, uh, for example, at low intensity, so slightly more. And my, and some weeks that are as little as 79% at as low intensity. And that was actually a race week. So I did two tune-up races and I also including them, included them in the calculations here. When I did races, I did one duathlon and one Olympic triathlon. And that meant that those weeks, some, an intense run and an intense bike uh, was skipped instead. So, so the races worked as uh, workouts. So, but still that made it the, made the distribution be a bit different than normal because I also trained a bit less. So that means that the, the variation there was around 
10%, like one week I can have 88% uh, low intensity and the other week 79%. And in terms of high intensity, my lowest high intensity week was only 1% and my highest was 7%. My lowest moderate intensity was 8%. And I did that three of those six weeks. My highest moderate intensity was when I did that Olympic race, which is all at moderate intensity, basically. So then I did 20% of my training at moderate intensity. So uh, there you go. That's uh, an example of my training and, and the race. It went brilliant. My swim was okay. I was 36 overall out of 700 something, uh, participants. I was uh, seventh after the bike and ended fifth after the run. I had a breakthrough run. I ran 120, 40 something. So that was actually very close to my 119 half marathon PB from an open half marathon. So that felt great. The bike was also excellent. It was one of the fastest bikes of the day uh, on a very tough course. Uh, it was uh, a two low 230s and uh, 255 normalized power at a weight of 67 or 68 kilograms. So, so, so fairly, fairly good watts per kg there. Uh, so on a, on a different difficult course to hold a high power and normalized power, because even though you hold very high power on those hills and some of the flats, there is a lot of coasting there as well. So it's quite stochastic. So not really your typical half Ironman course. So I was very happy with the results. And this training has been working really well for me. Again, it's very different to how I trained last year. Now I'm self-coached. It feels more sustainable. I'm doing more low intensity, less high intensity. And the high intensity that I do, I do more pyramidal training now. So less, especially in the run, I do less VO2 max type of work, even though I do do it, but it's not those track intervals with a squad that really kill me. Again, it comes back to that, how to do the hard workouts. I, 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 have, I haven't done a single puke workout, I think, in this build. I, I've done a few that were very, very hard, but... I could have gone on a few couple, a couple more minutes in the last interval, maybe. So I've never felt as snackered as I had, as I did last year in some of those workouts, especially those group swims and group runs. So, so this, this concept has been working really well for me personally. It's not necessarily the recipe for everybody, but I think that the high, low intensity training concept that came up as a suggestion for a term in that first question, which I, I loved so much. That is really brilliant. And, and I think that's the main takeaway from this episode. So I hope that you enjoyed this. You can find the show notes as usual on that triathlonshow.com. And uh, remember, send in questions because I will do a follow-up. There were some questions here in terms of beginner athletes, older athletes, um, what else? More time crunch age grouper questions, periodization questions, and differences between disciplines and distances. Some questions around VLA max and uh, the concepts talked about with Sebastian Weber, etc. That uh, I haven't got to yet. So I will do another follow up episode in the future, maybe even next week. I don't quite know yet, so we'll see. Uh, but send in your questions and uh, and I'll add them as well to the list to answer. Let me know what you think and uh, I really hope that you found this episode useful. Do stay subscribed to the show, no matter what you do, because there are new episodes coming out every Monday and Thursday and you don't want to miss them. There are plenty of great guests coming on, including, for example, in a not very distant future, Sebastian Weber is coming back on. He has more exciting topics to talk about that you will surely be excited about. So that's a little teaser for you. Stay subscribed so you don't miss anything. Don't ignore the Q&A episodes either because even though they are specific questions posted by specific listeners, I choose questions that are relevant for a large amount of listeners and, and I try to make the answers general as well as specific if you know what I mean, so that everybody can get takeaways from them. So those are really valuable episodes to listen to as well. Subscribe so you don't miss anything. And if you're a long-time listener, please leave a rating and review. That really means a lot to me if you can do that. Somebody who did that, and thank you so much for this, is B Walters 9 who writes excellent professional podcast with a star lineup of guests, five stars. I just got, just got back into triathlon after a seven-year hiatus and needed a place to start. I stumbled across this in my search and have listened to the last 50 episodes without stopping. Michael is articulate and asks the right questions to the experts he brings to the show. It is relatable for beginner and intermediate listeners alike. Five stars, easy. 
Thank you so much, B. Walters. And uh, you have almost 200 more episodes to catch up on in total because counting all the... Uh, all the episodes, the numbered episodes, but also the Q and A's and the beginner tips. I'm approaching 250 episodes very, very soon. So if you have listened to the last 50, then you have a long way to go to catch up on the entire archive. So have a look at that. Big thanks to Roka for sponsoring this episode. Go to roka.com and check them out and take 20% off your entire order with the promo code TTS, all caps, and to Precision Hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Take their free online sweat test to get your individual hydration strategy for your training and racing and get your first box or tube for free with the promo code that triathlon show all one word all caps thank you as always for listening keep training smart and keep loving triathlon